Here's another rarely seen pair of RM Williams, but I have high hopes that they may bring this back, at least seasonally, since they already have uh, the version that has the flat RM Williams rubber outsole. How are you going? Welcome to Bootlosophy, and if this is your first time here, my name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands I work on, the Wajit people here in Perth. Today, I'm diving into a model that RM Williams uh, doesn't make for now, but one that they still make in a different form. This is the urban turnout Chelsea boot. Currently, RM makes and sells the uh, comfort turnout, and I've reviewed a pair of these that you can see up there. The Comfort Turnout is the same boot, but with a flat RM Williams proprietary rubber outsole rather than this Vibram Commando lugged sole. This uh, Urban Turnout was available up to, I think, a, a couple of years ago. But with the way that RM these days bring models in and out of the back room uh, and sometimes offer different boots only seasonally, I have high hopes that this might come back because they are a slimmer and dressier lasted version than the current chunky gardener uh, on a Vibram Commander sole. And that one is going for Aussie $800. That's whopping. So come back urban turnout. In terms of design, it's obviously a Chelsea boot, about six inches high, uh, two side elastic panels, unmistakable. Uh, in this case, a hole cut, meaning only one piece of leather and one seam only at the back. And it's sat on a one piece uh, Vibram rubber lugged sole with a low block heel. For those who don't know, Chelsea boots are far from a recent invention. In fact, uh, they were first designed by uh, a man called Joseph Sparks Hall in 1837 for Queen Victoria. In those days, ladies boots were fastened by a series of buttons, hooks and laces and Vicky wanted an easy on and easy off boot for walking and riding. So good old Joe, her bootmaker, came up with his elastic sided riding boot. Initially, the gusset at the sides were made of tightly coiled wire, little tiny springs covered in cotton material. It wasn't until 1840 after Charles Goodyear had invented the process of vulcanized rubber. Uh, but before Goodyear patented it in 1844, uh, Sparks Hall replaced the tightly coiled springs with the rubber gussets. Joseph Sparks Hall patented this design, or, or his design, in 1840, and from there the elastic-sided boot gained popularity. Now I'll leave a link to an article from the Powerhouse Collection in the description area below, which lays out Sparks Hall's progress. And while I'm there, I'll also leave an affiliate link to the RM Williams website. When the elastic-sided boot became the uh, Chelsea boot is somewhat disputed though. It said in one corner that followers of fashion in the Royal Borough of Chelsea uh, copied Queen Victoria's footwear, especially after Sparks Hall patented and advertised the design. And since they were called the Chelsea set, the boots became known as the Chelsea sets boots and then Chelsea boots. In the other corner are the supporters of the swinging 60s. They say that when uh, the Beatles were getting kitted out with their Beatles suits, their manager wanted distinctive footwear for them and asked theatrical bootmakers Anello and David to make them with the addition of pointy winkle uh, picatos uh, and high Cuban heels. As other pop groups jumped onto the Chelsea bandwagon, uh, and since the swinging 60s were centered in the World's End area of the King's Road in Chelsea, they became known as Chelsea boots. Detractors of this theory say that the Beatles wore zip-sided boots, but if you look closely at old photos, you'll see them wearing both. After extensive research, I actually favour the Beatles theory. I cannot find any reference to Chelsea boots before the 60s, and all the ads I've seen before then just call them elastic sided boots. As well, the Chelsea as a riding boot or work boot became popular in the colonies of Australia, New Zealand, South Africa and India in the 1930s, and all RM Williams ads from that era call them elastic sided boots or even just riding boots. And they kept referring to them as such right into the 1940s and the 50s. The maker, R.M. Williams, is obviously, or not so obviously for some people I suppose, uh, it's an Australian company. 
It was founded by Reginald Murray Williams in 1932 after RM learned leather craft from an itinerant stockman called Dolomick in the Flinders Ranges of South Australia. RM made and sold saddles initially, but by 1934 when he set up shop in the Adelaide suburb of Prospect, his company was uh, gaining a, a, a reputation for his riding boots, which even in those days was already made from one piece of leather. RM kept growing the company over the next few decades, but it wasn't until as late as the late 70s that the company opened stores outside of Adelaide. By the late 80s, RM had stepped back from the business and eventually sold it in 1988, and a year later the company opened its first overseas store in London. Over the 90s and 2000s, RM Williams became a luxury goods brand, and ownership changed several times, uh, including ownership by private equity firms and uh, luxury goods firms like Louis Vuitton. I think it's fair to say that with every change of ownership, it became marketed as even more of a luxury brand and prices went up at every change of hands. In 2020, it was brought back into Australian ownership when uh, West Australian mining billionaire Twiggy Forrest bought the company. And clearly, it wasn't bought as a hobby and prices went up. <laughs> I've reviewed their most popular boot, the Comfort Craftsman, and you can see what I think up here. Okay now, let's jump into the construction of these boots. Uh, this time I'm going to start from the top. This leather is called Distressed Mustard. Why mustard is quite clear. Whenever a boot company calls the uppers distressed though, it's almost always Newbuck. Newbuck is not suede. In fact, you can see a detailed explanation of different types of leather uh, used for boots in my video here. Uh, a Newbuck is not a split, but it starts with a full grain leather that's then sanded or buffed so that the grain is kind of lightly cleaned off and exposes the looser fibers underneath that smooth surface. This treatment is what creates that fuzzy feeling as a slight nap uh, is raised from it. The most famous Newbuck boot is of course the Timberland classic yellow boot, see up here. Uh, and other work boot makers also use Newbuck because it is durable against cuts and grazes since its surface has a looser fiber structure to resist the sharper uh, cuts. If you tan it with more waxes and oils in it, it becomes crazy horse leather, often used for saddles as well because of its ability to withstand cuts and grazing. What makers call distress leather, like on this RM Williams Comfort Goodwood boot up here, is often crazy horse. But in this case, it's not waxed or oiled in the tannage and the nap feels dry and fuzzy, much more like uh, on the Tims. It's not thick, measuring a tad under two millimeters, uh, uh, but it's hard to measure since it is fully lined. Uh, with the lining, it's a bit over three millimeters. This is made or lasted onto a slimmer, more round, almond-shaped uh, toe last uh, than is on the Craftsman, which is a chiseled toe last, and the Goodwood or Gardener with roomier, wider lasts. Now, one thing I want to point out, I think in one video, I may have said that RMs were hand-lasted. They were once, but it was rightly pointed out to me by a viewer, uh, Mr. Ditkovich or Give Me Rent, it was his handle, I love that name, uh, that they're not hand lasted anymore. These are now made in a factory with one of those uh, mechanical lasting machines, uh, mechanical fingers that kind of pull the leather uh, over the last in a machine. Not to condemn RM for doing this, sign of volume production, it's just not hand lasted anymore, that's all. It is still a whole cut though, that's one piece of leather making up the whole uppers, not a, not a vamp piece sewn onto the quarters. This is only one seam up the back throughout the entire boot. Despite machinery, it's not easy lasting a flat piece of leather into a 3D shape. On the collar are sewn uh, two iconic cloth pull tabs with the brand name, uh, the address of the original shop, and the Made in Australia statement. The goring panels, that's the elastic, are different from the usual goring used by RM, which is smooth elastic material uh, with a fine weave. These use a wider weaved, almost honeycomb textured elastic panel. They make for an interesting feature and change, but I don't know if, uh, because the weave is not as tight, uh, whether or not they wear out faster and become maybe flabbier faster. Inside the boot, it's fully leather lined. The lining at the heel is a different color from the vamp. And while not suede, it's slightly rougher and grabs the heel. The stitching around the goring panels, uh, around the collar, 
uh, and down the seam at the back is pretty good, although there's one loose thread that I found here. Big deal, really. Going down the inside of the boot, there is a removable leather-topped foam insole, which gives a nice squish. Under that is a Texon leatherboard insole. Again, in another video, I said the insole was veg tan, which they are on some of my older RMs, but it was pointed out to me again that in uh, newer makes, like, like this one, they're actually leatherboard. It doesn't matter to me, but it might to you. Uh, going further down, this is a 270 degree Goodyear welted boot. The thin leather strip called the welt is sewn to the uh, insole and the uppers inside the boot, around the front three quarters, and then on the outside, the welt is stitched through into what looks like a leather midsole. The Vibram brick red one piece uh, sole is then glued onto the midsole. At the back one quarter, the uh, midsole and outsole are glued and nailed into the boot. And you can clearly see the nails going through the insole. For those wondering why they don't do a full 360 degree welt, it's usually explained as being able to create a more elegant back end. The lack of a welt at the back means the line of the heel is less sticking out than if a shelf of a welt is present. However, as you can see in this model, the leather heel rand, uh, that first layer of the heel, that in this case uh, evens out the level with the welt in front, that's quite sticky outy. <laughs> and it is, after all, a casual boot, so it's not dressy like a craftsman. So the real answer is, I have no idea. <laughs> because the machines and cut materials are all set up for a 270 welt, perhaps? I don't, I don't know. Uh, the other issue that might concern you is that the outsole is not stitched. And in fact, the, the whole rear end is not stitched to the uppers either. Well, I'm reliably informed that today's glues are extremely durable and it doesn't matter. If you take a look at Cobbler's videos, plenty of them on YouTube, uh, when they're trying to peel off a glued on rubber sole, it's hard. <laughs> uh, and the back end's nails and glues do the trick there, so no worries. As to leather care, basically, you would treat Nubuck as suede. On RM's uh, leather care page and the website, they say that Nubuck should be cleaned with a suede cleaner and maintained every three months with a suede protector. That's it. But at least they give you further information on their maintenance page. Why a different place? I, I have no idea. Um, so in their maintenance page, they say that prior to first wear, spray it with a suede protector. Basically, that's a, a, a waterproofing spray which they make or you can use Saphir's Involna spray or Tarago's Nano spray. They recommend respraying at least every three months. To clean the new buck, they recommend brushing it with a suede brush, one of those little uh, hard bristle ones uh, with, with really stiff bristles. And then you use a suede cleaner, which they also make, or use something made by Saphir or Timberland or some well-known product to clean uh, suede and new buck. The suede cleaner is usually sprayed onto a soft cloth and then worked into the boot. You, you don't actually lather it, you sort of rub off the dirt. Once dry, you rebrush the nap to raise it again. They don't say it, but if there are stubborn spots, you can use a suede eraser to rub off the dirt before you use the suede cleaner. Uh, as you can see, I have not cleaned these. <laughs> I have brushed them, but to me with the uh, Commando sole, these look like rugged boots that don't need babying. So I'm, I'm really not sure that I want to keep them pristinely yellow mustard. It's quite dusty. I think the actual darkened spots are quite attractive and show honest wear as long as I keep sandy grit and dust and mud off them by brushing regularly. When it comes to sizing, I buck the recommendations. RM Williams comes in UK sizes uh, and you should get true to size as measured on a Brannock device. UK sizes are one number down from US sizes. So uh, as I measure a US 8.5 in average D width, I should take this in UK 7.5, true to size, in RM's average width, which is denoted by their letter G. Just to be clear, I measure US 8.5, but in almost all my heritage boots, I take a US 8 because most US boot makers kind of size large. In my Vibergs, as well as UK brands like Cheney, uh, Grenson, uh, Crockett & Jones, I take a UK 7.5, true to size. In sneakers like Nike and New Balance, I take a nine, but you know, who knows what's happened there. Uh, now you tell me how clear the shoe industry is about sizing. Anyway, 
I should take this in UK 7.5 and RM Williams's G width. However, I have always found RM lasts to be quite slim on me, uh, especially at the ball of the feet and especially on my right foot. Also, it has more recently come to my realization that because most RM lasts are long due to the almond shape uh, and a narrow toe box, frankly, my heel to ball measurement in RMs is actually closer to a size eight in their boots. So I wear RMs in their size eight G and they're not too long in the toe. Uh, they fit me much better across the ball and flex at just the right place with their heel to ball measurement. I know that is no help to you at all, but you know, what can I say? I have tried a 7.5 H or wide width, and I find that to be too um, floppy across the ball, um, but also too short to be comfortable as they squeeze my toes when they, when they quickly narrow in. The best advice I can give you is to go to a store where you can try them on. But one thing about that is once you've bought the right size, it applies to all of their models. As for comfort, these are excellent. If you dial in the right size, the fit is great and keeps your feet secure inside a laceless boot. There is hardly any heel slip. There will be some because like cowboy boots, this laceless, uh, laceless design can never be uh, super tight across the instep down to the heel, down this angle. The removable insole and the softer compound Vibram gives a lot of squish and shock absorption. The outsole is also pretty grippy, so you always feel quite stable. This has a fiberglass shank inserted in the cork filler, which gives more than enough arch support and stability. I also like that it's airport friendly. Okay, price. Full disclosure, I bought these from a seller on eBay who buys out liquidated stock, brand new but not seconds. They cost me 379 Aussie, which is about uh, 250 US. The last time I saw them for sale in store new was about two years ago. Uh, they were under 600 Aussie, about 560 I think, before the most recent uh, couple of price rises. If they bring them back, I think they will align with the current prices and sell for about 650. 649 is the current is standard price. Are they value? I dither. On the one hand, they are still made in Australia with all of our high rents and wages, and they really are made with quality standards. The whole cut is a standout. Uh, the leather is from either Australia or New Zealand, and this one specifically has a Vibram outsole. And they are Goodyear welted, so resolable in time. They're also now seen as a luxury brand, although that's totally perception, isn't it? On the other hand, $650. Yes, you can compare them against Aussie high street cement construction brands uh, made in China or Vietnam, uh, Burma, Indonesian factories. Uh, and those sell for two to $300 and they're not recraftable. But heck, $650. You can get a fully handmade Chelsea from Melbourne handmade brand Wooten starting at $775 Aussie dollars, just over a hundred more, handmade. You can get a West Australian handmade Anastasi Chelsea, rare and hard to come by, and you have to wait, but for about 530 bucks. You tell me, is this like how Americans see Alden? Well, that's me in Cop Out Corner. <laughs> uh, if Iron Williams boots keep appearing new and not seconds on eBay, I, I will probably keep buying them. Or if I come across them in discount stores like Adelaide's DFO or in the Toowoomba sales, hell yeah. <laughs> but new at 650, I shall probably refrain and admire them from the other side of the shop window. Tell me what you think in the comments below and remember, your mother can read your comments. <laughs> at least, I hope this video was entertaining and of course if you found it so, you know what to do, click on like. Also, out of 35,000 or so returning viewers on my channel in the last month, only half of them are subscribers. Come on guys, if you keep coming back, help me out and click on subscribe. Heck, YouTube doesn't identify you so there's no downside, you can't be picked up. Well, don't miss what's coming up next as uh, at the time of recording this, uh, due to health issues, I'm recording a whole load up front and I'll be releasing them over a couple of months. So you uh, won't want to miss reviews on Red Wing Blacksmiths and an update on my Iron Rangers. Until then, take care and I shall see you soon.